Howdy folks, welcome back. You guys remember this old R model Mac? It's an RL600L. We worked on this one at the end of last winter. It had some problems where it didn't want to start. And now it's back in the shop and guess what? It doesn't want to start. So, I'll show you what's going on. We'll see if we can get it fixed up. Well this time the no start problem is a little bit different than the last time. Last time it had a bad relay. We replaced the relay and you know, then we did a whole bunch of other work. We did have some problems with the charging system, but I did some testing and it was working. It's just, you have to rev the engine up to about 1700 RPM for the voltage regulator to kick in on the alternator. So if you don't, if you just start it up and let it idle, it'll never charge the batteries. And this truck has kind of a goofy setup. It's 12 volt, but it has four six volt batteries. So there's two on either side hooked up in series, and then both pairs are hooked up in parallel. I think I may have found a parasitic draw, but anyway, first we're gonna test these batteries. I've had them charged. I've gone through and tested them all once before, but I wanna do it again. They were pretty far discharged, so sometimes it takes a while for them to come back around. Well, these batteries are only two years old. They seem to test out good, so I'm saying that they're fine. Well, it's helpful when you're making these YouTube videos if you actually hit the record button. Just a little, little tip for you guys out there. So I've already tested this battery. I know it's good. This is a dramatic recreation for the YouTube video. All we need it to do is stay above about four and a half volts for 15 seconds and put out half the cold cranking amps, which is 975, so yeah. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with this battery. Well, we've got some add-on doodads over here on the other side, so that's probably where I, I'm gonna start my hunt well, he asked me about replacing these battery cables, but well, they look pretty good to me. I mean, all things considered, I've seen a lot worse. So we're just going to clean them up a little bit. Maybe. And we're going to put some dielectric grease right on the contact surface. As controversially as possible. Uh, also, in my never-ending quest to own every obscure pair of pliers ever made. This is a special pair of pliers just for spreading battery cables, battery terminals. And it'll spread those out so they'll actually fit down on top of the posts. There, see that? It's got a hammer function too. <laughs> Well, one thing we got to be careful of though is not to get onto this frame because I think that is grounded. All right, did some snooping. These wires here are for a two-way radio. I don't know why it's fused on both the hot and the ground side, but it is. And then this wire here runs back to this plug right here. It must be for an electric tarp. This is a grain hauling truck. So the big wire for the tarp, not worried about that. But this wire for the two-way radio, we're gonna move that to something that's got power with the key on because it's it's too easy for that to, to get left on and run the batteries down. Try. <laughs> don't wanna be up here. Okay. So the positive cables come from either side of the the truck up to this master disconnect switch and then it just has a short jumper that runs out to the starter. Now this starter has an isolated field winding which means that the ground wires actually connect right to the starter. So I don't suspect we have a ground problem. I also don't see any problem here on these positive cables other than this one was rubbed through down at the bottom uh, down here by the frame rail so I did put some shrink tube over that and we're gonna put a little piece of hose over that or something so it won't rub again. You wanna show everybody the flags? Yeah, those used to mark where the electrical service came into the shop, but now they decorate a pedal tractor, don't they? Anyway, I scraped the inside of the terminals with this, this is a deburring knife. You can get this any place that, a, that sells machinist tools. And I just scraped that black crusty crap out of the inside so we've got nice bare copper going onto the 
the battery terminals, the battery lugs. And then I used dielectric grease and then sprayed down the outside with fluid film. Put a little bit of a rubber cushion on the inside of this one so it doesn't rub. Then over here on this master disconnect switch, I had a spot where the cable was rubbed through touching the frame. So I put a little bit of rubber on that, covered it with some shrink tubing. That looks pretty good. The wires here for the two-way radio, I moved those up to the terminal strips here on the firewall. And this one here is hot with the key on, so the radio won't be on all the time. And even if the radio is on all the time, at least now it's past the master disconnect switch. Before it was coming right out of the batteries. So hopefully we've got it. I think the biggest problem was that positive battery cable rubbing against the frame and just overall dirtiness of the cables. And it's back. Different problem this time. I guess the truck was stuck and they were trying to pull it out and somehow the truck made contact with the tractor they were pulling it with. So we got a little bit of John Deere green here on the hood. You see it pushed the front of the fiberglass hood in, bent this trim piece here. That's just a scratch, it's not a crack. But back here where the mounts are, it contacted the cab, so it actually bent this part of the cab a little bit, broke the fiberglass. But the big problem is the radiator was pushed back into the fan. I don't know if you guys can see the damage there on the core, but it's pretty substantial. Surprisingly, it's not leaking that badly. I actually went out to the farm and checked it out, and it was only about a gallon down on coolant. So I topped it off, and he actually drove it here. But you see the one of the water pump belts got shredded. This brace right here is bent. That's what allowed the radiator to come back. Anyway, I called the radiator shop this morning. Today's Tuesday. They said if I can get it in there today, there's a chance we can have it back by Friday. Of course, we're right in the middle of harvest, and they want this thing back ASAP. You know, it's all hands on deck for the harvest. Anyway, looks like we got to pull the hood off. The hood hinges actually bolt right to the core support. So that's probably going to be kind of the hardest, trickiest part of the job is getting the hood off. And then, yeah, it doesn't look too bad to extract the radiator. I noticed there's some run out in that water pump pulley. I think it's either bent or possibly the water pump shaft is bent. Something's going on there. So we'll probably get the radiator out first and then see what that looks like. Pulled the cables off the hood, set it down on that wooden stool, and then I think my plan is I'll take a paint marker and just draw the outline of these mounting bolts, and then maybe I'll just draw the outline of the bracket on the core support. Well, I can't do that because they're gonna, they're probably gonna paint that when they fix it. I'll figure out some way to get this thing back in the same spot. And then I'm hoping we can just set this hinge down onto the bumper. Well, that worked pretty good. So I just set the hinges down on some cardboard pads on top of the bumper. Should sit there just fine until I can get some help. Got the grip mat out. Went ahead and loosened up the shutter and the shroud. We should be able to pull the hoses off and these big braces on either side and then there must be something at the bottom I'll have to figure that out and then we can take the whole thing out the top so underneath we've got two big bolts they look like 5 8 bolts so 15 16 hex and then this big aluminum 
elbow. The elbow has got to come off for the radiator to go up. This gantry crane doesn't get used that often, but man, it is so handy when it does get used. Well, it's not very good. I'm not a radiator expert, but I would think that's going to have to have a core. See, it's gone through, what, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I don't know, at least nine tubes. I'm not sure about these ones, if they're leaking or if they're just bent over. Yeah. I don't know, it looked like it was in pretty good shape before that. I'm sure it's been out of there before. And it's got a rubber gasket here too, so it's probably been, probably been recorded at one time. Yeah. What a bummer. Anyway, it's out. Not a big deal. It took me about two and a half hours to get the radiator out. I don't think that's too bad. This truck's really not rusty, which is nice. I did break one bolt off. This one here for that support that was bent. I think it might have already been cracked from the, you know, the impact. So, yeah. Cool. Papers. We don't want that thing coming off. Ugh. Well, there's something wonky about these drive pulleys. This is the water pump pulley, and then the one down on the damper is the same way. I think that they're just bent. These are fabricated pulleys, so they're just stamped out of sheet metal. But just to be sure, I wanted to check the run out on the water pump flange, and it looks good within a few thousands. So we're gonna try to find a new pulley and then I went ahead and pulled the whole damper off the front here. You can take the pulley off without taking the the snout out of the crankshaft but you can see obviously the front main seal has been leaking so we're gonna replace that while we're here and then I also ordered a timing cover gasket set but I'm not gonna tear that apart until we get the gaskets to make sure that the parts are right because they're they're pretty hot for this thing. We also need a new, at least one new radiator mount bushing. This one over here was in pretty tough shape. And of course I'm having a hard time getting parts for this truck. It's got a lot of things working against it. It's 43 years old. I also think it's been put together from several different trucks. I think the whole cab, or at least part of the cab, is off of a different truck. It has two different VIN tags on the door. So yeah, it's been, been mixed and matched. I think maybe the hood is also off of a different truck. And then something is wrong about this air cleaner setup. See they had to chop out the fairing here to fit this snorkel. So yeah, some of this stuff is definitely not original. But the biggest problem is Mac itself. It's really hard to get Mac parts, at least from our local dealership. The parts are really expensive. They have a very limited amount of parts in stock. And if they don't have them in stock, it's a minimum three days to get them from you know whatever warehouse unless you want to pay air freight shipping and it's forty dollars per item to have next day shipping so if you go into the the steeler ship and you order a single bolt or a gasket or whatever and they don't have it on the shelf and you want it the next day add forty dollars to the bill uh, let's see the timing cover gaskets when I called them they're only available from Mac in a 10 pack or this little cover in a 20 pack or maybe it's the other way this one's a 10 pack and that one's a 20 pack and they're like $27 and $35 so I would have to buy 20 of one and 10 of each to get them from my local dealership this is gonna be like $500 to reseal this timing cover 
So luckily he found another dealer here in Illinois that had them in stock on the shelf and they actually agreed to ship them to me. So hopefully we'll have those today. Uh, the front main seal is also coming from them. The bushings, the radiator mount bushings, they do have them, but they're in Ohio or somewhere. I can't get them until Thursday. This is Friday, so it's almost another week. So we can't wait on that. Anyway, yeah, I'm going to try to find some used parts. We've got a pretty decent truck junkyard not too far away, and there's a lot of these R model mechs, you know, sitting in the boneyard. Well, that was a waste of time. They had one engine that I think had the right pulleys on it. It was a 1984, but the engine was supposedly a running engine. They wouldn't sell parts off of it. The only way I could get them was to buy the whole engine for $2,500. That exceeds our budget, so we're stuck with these. I got it chucked up in the brake lathe. I'll show you what the runout looks like. It's about 30 thousandths on that first groove, and it's pretty much the same in all of them. So, so I am going to attempt to straighten these pulleys. I'm not sure how, and I'm not sure how well it's going to work. Stand by. This is the crankshaft pulley. I've got it chucked up. I just chucked up that stub in my engine lathe, and I'm measuring the run out. Sorry, there's a glare from the window, but it's pretty bad. something like 60 maybe 70 thousandths total run out and it's got a spot right there where it just goes way off the chart so I'm gonna do a little little hammering see how it comes out All right, I think that's about as good as we're gonna get I'm down to about 15 thousandths total run out Maybe a little less than that. It's pretty decent. All right, folks, let's get caught up. I'll start with the good news, or the best news that I have. Eight days and $1,500 later, I finally have the radiator back. It did get a new core, as we expected. Found some other problems. When I took the lower mounting bolts out, the left one here, when I took this one out, I got some coolant around the threads, and it actually dribbled out, out of the hole. I told him about that when I dropped the radiator off, and when he got the radiator apart, he told me that it was actually cracked. He thinks that maybe somebody put a bolt in here that was too long and it bottomed out, and it broke out the bottom of the casting where the, the threads come in. Anyway, it's actually recessed in the bottom of the tank. I've got a picture I'll superimpose here, and you can't get access to it to weld it. Plus, he said that these tanks are... They're aluminum, but they're like high in zinc or something, and they're very difficult to weld. He said almost everyone he's ever seen somebody try to weld has en eventually ended up leaking. So anyway, they, they filled it with some sealer. They filled that pocket with some sealer or epoxy or something. He said he's done that before and had good luck, and he recommended that I put some RTV on the threads when I put the bolt back in. So it wasn't leaking around those threads before, to my knowledge, so I don't think it's going to be an issue. It's just you know, kind of a problem. I tried to find a new or a used lower radiator tank, could not find one. Anyway, it's been pressure tested, all new gaskets, should be good to go. I also removed the timing cover. We're gonna replace the timing cover gaskets along with the front main seal. It's been leaking pretty bad up here in the front, so I wanna try to seal things up. We've already got it torn down this far, so mazel. It's not a bad job. You gotta remove the front engine mount. There's a big horseshoe I'll show you guys. And then I've just got the front of the engine supported. It's just hanging from the gantry crane right now. So we got lucky on the timing cover. The, the oil pan gasket is still intact and it's still on the oil pan. That's always the fear is that you're going to tear the oil pan gasket when you take the timing cover off. Well, it was quite an ordeal to get these timing cover gaskets. I called my local Mac dealership. He told me to go to another Mac dealership down in Decatur, Illinois. They had already bought the packs of 10 and 20, and they had like 18 of them on the shelf. So I called them, they had all the parts I needed, and they were willing to ship them to me. Decatur's about, I don't know, probably 250 miles from here. 
Anyway, I gave her a credit card number and a shipping address. She was going to ship them out via FedEx, and I was supposed to have them the next day. That was a week ago. I called her the next day after no one showed up, got a tracking number, no tracking information available. Tried it again on Friday, no tracking information available. Called them up on Monday, tried to find out you know, what was going on. She verified that FedEx had picked the parts up. They had been removed from inventory, but they were lost in Neverland. So she actually pulled the same parts off the shelf, you know, another set, and transferred them to Morton, Illinois. And then I drove down there and picked those parts up. It's about a four hour round trip, which, you know, that sucks, but I gotta get this project moving. And it's, you know, it's not the customer's fault that FedEx lost that package, so. Anyway, I've got the parts now. We should be able to install the timing cover. So you're probably wondering why I didn't just make my own gasket or throw the gasket out altogether and use some RTV. And I thought about doing that, but the problem is these little bronze thrust plates right here. So these are what set the, the end thrust clearance for the timing gears. And it's dependent on the thickness of the gasket. So I really didn't want to screw that up. And they are adjustable, but I don't have a a service manual for this old truck that tells me how to set those so I'd rather just put it back like it was. And that brings us to our next problem which is the front main seal. So this is a Mac part but it does not come with a wear sleeve. Here's the wear sleeve that I removed from the harmonic balancer. It was actually worn all the way through. It came off in two pieces. Anyway I asked the dealership parts guy about that. He said he's never seen a wear sleeve installed on one of these old Macs and there is no Mac part number for it. He said I have to go aftermarket and get a speedy sleeve. There is one available. Chicago Rawhide has it. National Oil Seal has it. It's a 99325, so 3.25 inch diameter. Problem is it's special order from the manufacturer. It would take me at least a week to get it. So I'm not 100% sure what we're going to do about that yet. It does have a pretty good groove worn in here. Uh, but we might be able to try some little tricks and, and kind of get around that. <sighs> yeah, that's the wrong seal. It's got the right inside diameter, but does not have the right outside diameter. So, I called my Mac dealership, I called the Decatur Mac dealership, I called an aftermarket truck supplier, Midwest Wheel, I called a driveline shop, I called my local auto parts store, I called my local Napa store. No one has this seal. So I finally tried Motion Industries and got a hold of the right person there. They have one in the warehouse in Chicago and they have the speedy sleeve. I can have both of them at 8 o'clock tomorrow. Kind of spendy, but what choice do we have? Got the front of the engine cleaned up, ready to start going back together. I removed one broken bolt from this hole and then cleaned out the threads on the other hole. So we should be able to put all the bolts back in. And we do have a little problem down here on the oil pan gasket right there around that bolt hole the gasket material pulled away. So what we're going to do is use a little bit of the Permatex Ultra Gray. We want to use it in the corners anyway. So we'll put some in the corners and then we'll kind of fill in these areas and maybe just put a little bead all the way along that oil pan gasket. And yeah, that's all we can really do if we don't want to drop the oil pan. Sorry guys, I forgot to hit record. So all you miss is I had to trim a little bit off the bottom of each side of the gasket so that the holes were centered up here. Because we're doing this out of order, you're supposed to install the timing cover first and then the oil pan. Come on. 
All right, the timing cover is installed. Bolts are torqued to 29 foot-pounds. Looks good. This timing cover is kind of odd, I think. There's no dowel pins, so there's nothing that really aligns the front main seal to the crankshaft. And then this whole timing cover is, well, it's stamped out of steel and then kind of fabricated together. You see there's welds down there by the oil pan and the, the front snout there where the main seal is is welded on. And that's actually the engine mount. So this stamped sheet metal cover is the front engine mount. So all the way to the front of the engine rests right here. Well, I take back at least a few of the horrible things I've said about Motion Industries. At least they have parts. All right, we gotta install the speedy sleeve. And it comes with a installer cup, looks like this, that you can use to drive the thing on. The problem is it's not deep enough. The sleeve's gotta go all the way, I don't know, down this far or so. So I was trying to think of a way to push that on, a tool I might have. This is a cup out of a wheel bearing installation tool, but it's just a little bit too small. The next bigger one's a little bit too big. So I scrounged around in the junk pile, found an old oil filter. This one happens to be a Mopar. It didn't work out quite as well as I hoped. I had to cut it below the crimp in order to get the guts out of it. But the rolled crimp part is the part I need. That's the part that actually is the right size. So I just cut it and then tack welded it back on. We're gonna try that. It's easy to screw these up. So you kinda need to have the right tool. I think we're gonna use the tool that came with it to get it started. Try the redneck tool. Come on. I measured the old sleeve. That worked. Cool. I'm just cooking the front damper hub. It's a pretty snug fit on the crankshaft, so we're gonna heat her up to, I don't know, 300, maybe 400 degrees Fahrenheit. Should slip right on. This is the bolt that came out of the bottom of the radiator, that bottom tank, and it looks for sure like it was too long, and it actually deform the threads on the bolt, and then I'm sure that's what broke the bottom of that tank. So I'm gonna cut the ends off, chamfer them back, put a little sealant on them, and should be fine. I was able to score a better used lower radiator mount at the junkyard, so I've already got that installed. This one is hooped. And the lower neck here, it's pitted pretty badly on the flange. And then the, the tank is also pitted pretty badly. And he couldn't clean it up on the belt sander because it's recessed. So we're going to use a little bit of this stuff. So I think that's it guys, thanks for watching. I guess the lesson here is if your Mack truck gets stuck, be real careful pulling it out because you might end up with an expensive repair bill. And if your only semi truck is 43 years old, uh, be prepared for some downtime if it breaks because it is not easy to get parts. This truck's actually been here for 11 days. And you know, it, it's a bummer for him because this is a seasonal use truck, you know, he only uses it like two months out of the year and we took a two-week chunk out of that so yeah he's not gonna get a whole lot of good out of it this year but that's the way it goes and you know and that's why he has insurance so 
yeah, at least it's back on the road. Anyway, thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys next time. Sure changes the view without the corn. So he's spreading lime with that machine, which is basically a byproduct of them crushing gravel. Lots of limestone in this area. So once he gets that spread, they'll come by and till it in with a, I don't know, probably a chisel plow. And then at some point they're gonna spread or well, they're going to till in liquid manure on this field, which is quite an operation. <laughs> well, folks, you just can't make this stuff up. It's Saturday morning. I sent that Mac home about 9.30. And look what the FedEx guy just brought me. I'm sure that's a timing cover gasket set and a front main seal. So I'm going to send it back to the dealership. We'll see how long that takes. With any luck, I might get a refund by Christmas. Well, thanks for watching, guys. See you next time.